I invite you to stand for the reading of God's Word. As it comes to us from the 17th chapter of the book of De- Genesis, now I'm reading from the message. And what we want to keep in mind is the message is considered a paraphrase, a little bit different than a translation. A translation is really more of a word for word translation from uh, the original language. A paraphrase is someone who has taken it and they've translated it in a way that's maybe a little bit more user friendly. Um, Just listen how Dr. Eugene Peterson translated this passage in his book called The Message. When Abram was 99 years old, God showed up and said to him, I am the strong God. In Hebrew, that would be El Shaddai. That's what she sang earlier, right? God showed up and said to him, I am the strong God. Live entirely before me. Live to the hilt. I'll make a covenant between us, and I'll give you a huge family. Overwhelmed, Abram fell flat on his face. Then God said to him, This is my covenant with you. You will be the father of many nations. Your name will no longer be Abram, but Abraham meaning that I'm making you the father of many nations. I'll make you a father of fathers. I'll make nations from you. Kings will issue from you. I'm establishing my covenant between me and you, a covenant that includes your descendants, a covenant that goes on and on, a covenant that commits me to be your God and the God of your descendants. And I'm giving you and your descendants this land where you're now just camping, this whole country of Canaan, to own forever, and I'll be their God. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thank you, Diane. That was a lot of fun. I think we could have spent all morning. I was looking out thinking, I'll bet there are some of us that would love to have her look up our names and see, see what they mean. But I'm going to come at this from a, another little different direction. I'm going to read you some names, and I want you to think about what meaning you attribute to these names. All right. You ready? What meanings do these names have for you? Abraham Lincoln. Amelia Earhart. I didn't think about making this interactive. I'm going to I'm going to do that. We're a little with the cold we're kind of few but mighty this morning, right? Okay. So real quick, I mean, shout it out. When I say Abraham Lincoln, what did you think of? Oh, that didn't work like I thought it would. (laughs) Freeing the slaves. Yeah. Hmm? Bold. Honest. Okay. Amelia Earhart. Fearless. Brave. Okay. Charles Manson. Evil. Hmm? Scary. 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 Yeah. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Brave, inspirational, freedom. It's amazing, a name just, you know. Adolf Hitler. Rosa Parks. Brave. Mm -hmm. Jesus Christ. I'm betting whether you shouted out or not, as soon as I said a name, you had a response, didn't you? 
that name had a meaning, probably regardless of what was in your book, Diane. Um, names, have, names have meanings. Um, sometimes na names have meanings because the name was crafted from another word, right, that has value. I remember many, many years ago asking my mother one time, I said, by the way, why did you name me Cheryl? Of all the names out there, why did you pick that one? And she said, well, I always wanted a Sherry, which I thought was really interesting because I've never been Sherry. <laughs> and, you know, I thought later, why didn't she just name me Sherry? <laughs> um, but um, Sherry comes from the French word, Sherry, which means dear. That's kind of nice. I like that a lot. Um, Names matter, and um, they, it's the reason why we often think about that when we name our children, right? We think long and hard about the names that we want to give to our children um, because we know that it's something that they will live with throughout their lives, and maybe there are different meanings or values we've heard attributed. Um, sometimes children are named after their parents, aren't they? Because that's conveying a meaning. But at the same time, sometimes names have meaning because of the way a person lives their life. You bring meaning to your name. When someone speaks your name, the way that you have lived your life is going to imbue that name with value. I remember my father saying one time, um, I don't know if I have it quite right, but what he said was to the effect of this, he'd say, um, in case someone tells a lie about you, live your life in such a way that nobody would believe them. That's pretty good, isn't it? And um, I think about so many of you think about all of you and there's a lot of things people could say about you i this is kind of come out wrong that i wouldn't believe <laughs> I, I know i know what kind of people that you are good and faithful and grace-filled so we want to live our lives in ways that um people wouldn't believe a lie about us. In fact, there are people who have changed their name because of something a family member did that shamed the family. Um, a couple of the names I've mentioned, I mean, the son of Charles Manson, can you imagine? Relatives of Adolf Hitler, some of them have literally changed their names because it was too great a burden to bear. Sometimes names have meaning based on the way we live our lives, how we conduct ourselves, how we treat other people. And uh, names in the Bible are extremely important. As you read your Bible, as you read those footnotes, as you read the commentaries, always take the time to read the little footnotes that talk about what the names mean because most of the time, names have a special meaning. They convey something about what was going on in that person's life or the meaning that their lives meant. And um, a name in the Bible always conveyed an important meaning. In our lesson today, the man's name was Abram, Abram. And if we were to look it up, it is based out of Ab, Abba, which in Hebrew was father. In fact, it really is better translated daddy. Did you know that? I remember years ago taking a confirmation class to a Jewish temple to visit, and before the Shabbat service had started, the young rabbi was there, and his little son was running around, and I heard the little boy running toward him shouting, Abba, Abba, and all of a sudden it made sense. Daddy, daddy. And I got to thinking, um, many Sundays we do the Lord's Prayer, and how does the Lord's Prayer start? Our Father, what do you suppose the word was that Jesus used? Abba. Does it change the prayer to say, Daddy? 
speaks of a very hopefully intimate relationship, doesn't it? Daddy's, t- daddy's different than father. Abram means exalted father. But an interesting thing happened because when God made his covenant, which was a binding agreement with Abram, God said, your name will no longer be Abram, exalted father, but it will be Abraham, meaning father of many nations. God made this agreement with Abram, but there was a response, and when Abram agreed to pack up his tent and pack up his wife and pack up all of his stuff and go where God was calling him to go to this new place, God says, you are changed, and from now on your name will be Abraham, you will be the father of many nations. And what news that must have been considering how old was Abram? 99. It's never too late. It's never too late for God to place that call on our lives. It's never too late for us to respond and be used by God. It's never too late or too old for us to be changed. When we enter into a relationship with God, when we answer that call to be a part of what God is doing in the world, when we answer that call to be used by God for the transformation of the world, we are changed. And names matter. In the Old Testament, we remember the story of Moses And if you remember, Moses had gotten kicked out of Egypt, right? And he's wandering around in Midian where he's made a new life for himself. And as he wanders around Midian, he receives this call from God to make the journey up to the top of Mount Sinai. And when he gets to Sinai, he encounters a burning bush. And through that burning bush, Moses receives this call to return to Egypt and to be a part of the freedom that would come in leading the Hebrews out of slavery in Egypt. But Moses knew that names mattered. And so he asks this really great question. He says to God, okay, if I'm going to do this, I've got a question for you. Who do I tell the Hebrews sent me to do this? Who do I tell the Hebrews is giving me the authority to be your leader and lead you out from under um, the whips of Pharaoh? Who am I going to tell the people sent me? In essence, Moses was asking the question. He was saying, hey, what is your, what's your name? Because names matter. And God said, I am that I am. Tell the people that I am has sent you. Now, why does that matter? It's huge. At least it's huge, huge, huge in my faith journey. It's huge for me. You know, I mentioned last week, I've picked the passages I'm preaching the rest rest of this first half of the year because I'm sharing some that have been most powerful in my journey. And this has been powerful in my journey as I think about who Jesus is and who Jesus is for us. Because we want to remember that burning bush story when God said, tell the people that my name is I am. Because when Jesus was facing his accusers, Jesus said, I tell you the truth. Before Abraham was, I am. At that moment, in many ways, Jesus had claimed his own death sentence. Why? Because to his accusers, this was blasphemy. This was heresy beyond measure. For what was it that Jesus was announcing about himself? 
that he was one with God. He was claiming the name for himself. In the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus asked the soldiers, he said, who do you seek as they came to arrest him? Who do you seek? And the soldiers responded, Jesus of Nazareth. That's who we seek. And Jesus said to them, I am. And why do I know that he was claiming the person of God? Because scripture tells us that as soon as he said that, the soldiers fell to the ground. I don't think just saying, yeah, it's me, would have done that. He was speaking in that moment the very essence of who he is for us, the second person of the Trinity. Names matter. They have meaning. And for that reason, we see over and over again that a relationship with God, a covenant agreement with God, opening our hearts and our lives and our minds to Christ, changes our identity. It changes who we are. Jacob wrestles with an angel, and his name is changed to Israel. Anytime you see El, E-L, El, that's God. Israel struggles with God. Abraham's wife, Sarai, had her name changed to Sarah when she accepted the promise that she was going to bear a son in her 90s. Can you get your mind around that, Linda? No. Simon the fisherman... He became a disciple of Jesus, and his name was changed to Cephas. That's the Hebrew name. But in Greek, it's Petra, rock. When Peter, Petra, Shimon, he chose to follow Jesus, he committed his life to Christ. He was changed forever. And Jesus renamed him Rocky. God is always calling us into relationship with him, a covenant. God says, I will be your God and you will be my people. Jesus, I am, says, I am the vine. You are the branches. Connect your life to me and you will receive my life-giving presence. God wants to bless you and in turn, he wants you to be a blessing like Abraham to the world. If Abraham and Sarah can be blessed by God and bear a son in their 90s to be the parents of a nation, how is God calling us? How is God challenging us in our lives? How is God challenging First Wayne Street to be a transforming presence in the world around us? And because we are loved and blessed by God and called by God, he gives us a new name, Christian. And I wondered as I thought about this, do our lives reflect those values of being a Christian back to the world? What does your life reflect when somebody hears your name? What is the first thing they think? Um, so I want to challenge you this morning um, because it does matter what our lives reflect. Um, one of the images that I think is so powerful, I'm shifting gears here a little bit, but I want to talk about a new, new ministry that we're very excited about. When I think about ministry and I think about the church, I've always felt this way. To me, a plant is a wonderful metaphor because with a plant, as you know, there's the stuff you see above the ground and there's the stuff that's going on below the ground. And I think it's important for a plant to be healthy. You've got to have both of those things going. You've got to have a healthy root structure. And you also should be bearing fruit, whatever that looks like. And a good gardener makes those things balance. And I think in many ways, uh, First Wayne Street is doing a great job of bearing fruit, working with Redemption House, working with the live community outreach, working with the rescue mission, 
reaching out into the world around us. To make that to con continue to happen in healthy ways, we also need to work on the root structure, the foundation. And that's us, always growing in our discipleship, always growing in our relationship with Christ, always growing as disciples. And so what we want to do is kick off this morning, I mentioned to you last Sunday, but we want to kick off this morning Faith Share. And Faith Share is the name for a new small group ministry. And I'm inviting you this morning to be in prayer about joining one of the Faith Share groups, about being a part of a small group. Our first round of Faith Share groups, and we have five um, five groups already scheduled with facilitators. We have five of these. They will meet once a week in February and March, eight weeks. So it's going to kick off the beginning of Feb Thank you, Marilyn. I saw her do just what I meant to do. Once you, in your worship bulletin, we put an insert in. And if you take a look at this, um, we have listed the meeting times and locations. So on Wednesdays at 6 p.m., uh, Lynn Gilmore will be facilitating a group in her home, Southwest. On Sundays at 5 p.m., Diane May and the Ehlers will be facilitating a group in the Ehlers home. I kind of call them the 07 group because they're the 07 zip code area. And geography may or may not matter to you. Thursdays at 6.30, Deb and Dan Metzger um, will be hosting a group in their home, which is northeast off of Maple Crest. And um, Walt and Marilee Gilliland will also be a part of that group. Also Thursdays at 6.30, Chris and Emily Ford will be facilitating a Southwest group in their home. And I know they've been gracious enough to say they're going to have some intentionality about being child care friendly. So we'll work with that depending on who signs up. And then Wednesdays, since some of you are already coming out for making the connection on Wednesdays, there will be a Wednesday 4 o'clock group um, that I will be facilitating with Ann Kramer. So you've got five options there. We are trusting the Spirit. We're not sure where people will sign up. We don't know how many people will sign up. We don't know if there are other places that we need to even get a group started, and we can do that as well. But what I've discovered over the years is when I make that commitment to become part of a small group, I grow, I build new relationships, I'm surrounded by people that can help strengthen my journey and be there for me when I need some care. Small groups are one of the most effective ministries for churches that are fruitful and that continue to grow. And they create these wonderful, com comfortable entry places so that as we have new people coming to the church, as I'm meeting new people, that want to be a part of the church, it gives us a place to plug them in to get acquainted. So I'm going to invite you to be in prayer about this. Um, after worship, um, our facilitators will be out at the tables, um, and you can sign up there. You can sign up through Sign Up Genius. The information is here. You can sign up by calling me or Audra. You can contact the facilitators. There's no way you can miss it. And I'm hoping that you will consider a part of being one of these small groups meeting for eight weeks. And they can talk with you some more a little bit about how the groups will be arranged and the material that we will be um, covering. What I'd like to do, I'm going to invite um, Jeff to go ahead and move us into our next hymn. I'm going to invite you to remain seated. Singing, prayerful, thoughtful about your own life and your own faith journey and what your life reflects and what your name means and how faith share could be a part of you growing. <laughs> 